welcome to this wonderful uh, presentation by Tessa Rubain. Uh, lovely to see a young archivist, huh, Tessa? Uh, beautiful, beautiful young archivist. Uh, uh, of course, we, we all know that uh, how important the Academy has been functioning as giving us Oscars. But very few people know that they have such a wonderful archive. And uh, we've been seeing it. And I've had the fortunate uh, that last year I was there at the um, academy and I was able to go with Mike Pepogo and see the wonderful archive. Tessa Erwine is, is working with Joe Linda, mm -hmm. uh, who's the film preservation man there. He handles it. Head, head, head of the thing. Oh, and a great friend of ours. And uh, today Tessa is going to take us through uh, the role of the academy as far as preserving films, also, we're going to look at some of the 4K restoration they've been doing. Most importantly, to all of us who want to know how Pathir Panchali was restored, <laughs> uh, you will have all the answers from her. So, Tessa, I now leave it to you to take the presentation through. And I think okay. if we finish early, we will have a few Q&A uh, yeah. to, to talk about. Yeah. Okay. Is this, and I just want to say, Pathir Panchali is going to be screening tomorrow at 2.30, right. um, I believe, at the Machinez. All right, so, um, so don't so miss that. I'm going to talk about it, and then you should go see it. <laughs> yeah. Don't miss that. It's yeah. one of the most wonderful restorations from... It looks beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think you guys will be surprised to see from where they pulled that out yeah. and how the restoration was done. So now, so get to going. you, Tessa. Yeah, get please. Going. Thank okay. you. Okay, um, just before I get started, I wanted to show a really quick little video just to give a taste of the kind of films um, the Academy has been preserving for the past 20 plus years. So. That video just really pumps me up, so I wanted to yeah. start with it. <laughs> so hello uh, and welcome. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Um, and I want to express just how honored I am to be a part of this wonderful and impressive festival. And a very big thank you to Shivendra for that very kind introduction um, and to the festival organizers for inviting me here to speak with you all. Um, my goal today is really to instill in all of you the importance of film preservation, which is a pursuit I've chosen to dedicate my life to. Um, I'm going to take a leap and assume you're all here today and attending this festival because you are film lovers. Um, so I don't think I need to tell you just how vulnerable film can be, both on its original celluloid form and its new digital formats. The Library of Congress has documented that only 20% of US feature films from the 1910s and 20s survive in complete form in American archives. Of the American features produced before 1950, about half still exist. For shorts, documentaries, and independently produced works, we really have no way of knowing how much has been lost. And the future of digital-born content is just as scary. Uh, we still don't know the effect digital media will have on the long-term preservation of motion pictures. 
The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences takes this vulnerability very seriously, and it has been collecting, preserving, and promoting film since the very beginning of the organization. Uh, I wanted to share our mission statement, as I think it very succinctly sums up what it is we try and do every day at the Academy. The mission of the Academy is to recognize and uphold excellence in the motion picture arts and sciences, inspire imagination, and connect the world through the medium of motion pictures. It does this by preserving the past, honoring the present, and shaping the future of motion pictures. So today, I'm going to give you some information and background on the Academy and its work, uh, explore the concept of film preservation, and showcase some of the projects we've completed, including the works of Satyajit Ray. So it's very likely that when a lot of you think of the Academy, you think of the Oscars and the glamorous red carpet celebrities being shown in this video. And I wouldn't blame you, that's all I used to think too, uh, prior to getting my degree in film archiving and preservation. And yes, that is a large part of the Academy. In fact, the Oscars is what funds the entire rest of our organization. Money made from uh, advertisements and endorsements from the telecast goes towards operational costs for all other facets of the Academy, of which there are many. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences was founded in 1927 by 36 members of the film industry, including well-known names like Louis B. Mayer, Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, and Douglas Fairbanks, who was the Academy's first president. The Academy's library was established in 1928, and we began acquiring film as early as 1929. The first Academy Awards was held in May of 1929. So it's clear that while the awards grew to become a cultural juggernaut, the act of protecting film was always a high priority. As I mentioned, the Academy's Margaret Herrick Library was established in 1928, and it is a world-renowned, non-circulating reference collection based around the moving image and its history. It's open to the public, and it includes books, photographs, uh, scripts, production records, correspondence, and a lot more. This video here is highlighting some of the library's holdings, but there's, there's too much to even name. We hold over 10 million photographs, 80,000 screenplays, 50,000 posters, 20,000 production and costume design drawings, and 1,400 special collections. The Academy's oral history program started in an earlier iteration all the way back in 1948 when film curator Howard Walls began interviewing a number of silent film pioneers. These early recordings progressed into full, in-depth, long-form interviews with over 70 individuals. The oral histories department was officially established in 2012 in order to unify and manage all forms of oral history at the Academy, and it has now recorded 124 interviews which relates to 456 hours of content. They've also worked to digitally preserve over 1,200 filmmaker interviews, which is over 3,691 hours. So here's just a little sample of the kind of interviews being documented by our oral histories team. You know, the value of entertainment, um, you know, you, you can bring so much to somebody's life you know, somebody who's lost a loved one or somebody who's old or somebody who's ill or somebody who's homebound. And you can give them so much, you know. I think it's, it's really, when you think about it, the enormity of it. Um, it goes beyond number one, number two, number three, or, uh, or how much you earn. You know, at, at the end of the day, what you give people, I think it's uh, very rewarding and makes me feel very humble. In addition to our library and oral histories department, we also host the Student Academy Awards every year, which originally started back in 1972. Past Student Academy Award winners have gone on to receive 46 Oscar nominations and have won or shared eight awards. They include John Lasseter, Pete Docter, Robert Zemeckis, Trey Parker, uh, Spike Lee, and a lot more. Our Nickel Fellowship in Screenwriting began in 1986 as a way to aid new screenwriters. This year, the fellowship received 6,915 script submissions, and to date has given out a total of 147 fellowships. 
This year's winners were each granted $35,000 to help bring their scripts to the screen. Our Science and Technology Council began in 2003, focusing on industry-wide collaboration, studying and preserving the technological history of filmmaking, and producing informative and entertaining programs to teach industry professionals as well as the general public about the ways in which technology serves the art of motion pictures. They recently won an engineering Emmy for creating ACES, or the Academy Color Encoding System. And then we also have a number of education initiatives, including SPARK at the Academy, which provides apprenticeships in filmmaking to middle school youths from underserved communities. More recently, the Academy has been working on opening our new museum, with the intention of it being the world's leading movie museum in the heart of Los Angeles. Construction is underway at the historic Wilshire May Company building, uh, just adjacent to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. This 290,000 square feet museum will take advantage of the Academy's world-renowned collection of movie-related artifacts, posters, photographs, films, and video. It will consist of both permanent and temporary exhibition space, an intimate, see, th quote, intimate, 300-seat theater, a premier 1,000-seat theater, and demonstration, demonstration stages. As of now, it's scheduled to open in 2018. So now this brings us to why I'm personally here with all of you, which is the Academy Film Archive. While the Academy started collecting film material in 1929, the Academy Film Archive wasn't officially started until 1991. When we began, we were just two lonely staff members working under the stairs at our Margaret Herrick Library in Beverly Hills. We moved into our own facility in 2003, uh, what was known as the Don Lee Mutual Broadcasting Building in Hollywood. Uh, as an old television studio, the Don Lee Building worked perfectly for transforming into film vaults with thick concrete walls and high ceilings that help regulate temperature well. As of today, we have 35 staff members, uh, which includes four preservationists. In total, we have six film and video vaults, and with the exception of our nitrate holdings, which are extremely flammable and thus stored off-site in specialized vaults, all of the archive's film and video is held in our Pickford building in Hollywood. We have almost 200,000 items relating to close to 92,000 film titles and weighing in at about 500 tons of film. Our vaults are strictly regulated, with our coldest vault consistently kept at 45 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 7 degrees Celsius, and 30% relative humidity. In the world of film, cold and dry is really the name of the game. A cold and dry environment, when well regulated, can keep film from deteriorating and in stable condition for hundreds of years. Part of our mandate is to hold copies of every Academy Award winning film in the Best Picture category, as well as Oscar winning documentaries, shorts, and nominees in other categories. However, our collection does not just consist of Oscar-nominated and winning films. We hold immensely diverse collections of home movies, short films, documentaries, avant-garde and experimental films, and student films. Our collection is accessible to researchers and the public by way of public screenings, loaning films to other venues, uh, viewing material in our public access center, and now our website. To date, we have preserved close to 1,000 films. So before I get into the depths of film preservation, I wanted to give a bit of a rundown on terminology and film basics, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know all of this, but I'll give a quick recap. So film can come on a multitude of different gauges, running from as small as eight millimeter to as large as 70 millimeter. Uh, eight, super eight, and 16 millimeter are most common in the home market for amateur filmmakers, avant-garde and experimental filmmakers, and home movies. The cameras are just lighter and uh, cheaper and more portable. 9.5 and 28 millimeter are far less common and were specifically created for the home market as well. 35 is the most common gauge. It's what most studios used and what most commercial film prints are made on. And then we have 70 millimeter, which is a wide, high resolution format. Um, most recently, filmmakers like Christopher Nolan and uh, Quentin Tarantino have been trying for a wide film resurgence with 70 millimeter releases of Interstellar and The Hateful Eight, and I know they have a few more uh, coming up soon. Celluloid film comes on three different stocks. With um, the advent of the moving image back in the late 1800s, film was made out of nitrocellulose, or nitrate. 
Nitrate existed solely on 35 millimeter and it's incredibly flammable. It requires no oxygen to burn, so once it ignites, it's almost impossible to extinguish. Aside from the flammability issue, nitrate is susceptible to high temperatures and humidity and can begin to deteriorate if not kept cool and dry. Safety or acetate film was um, first introduced on 28 millimeter in the 1910s, specifically for the home market to help combat the safety concerns of nitrate. While it's not likely to randomly explode like its nitrate counterpart, safety film has its own set of issues, mainly its susceptibility to acetate deterioration or vinegar syndrome, so-called because of the vinegar-like smell that comes off the film when it's also not kept cool and dry. And then finally, we have polyester film, which is our current preferred film stock. It's incredibly durable with superior strength, and it's seemingly unaffected by temperature changes or humidity, uh, and it doesn't release any harmful gases. Some common forms of film decay uh, and damage that can make preservation a challenge include color fading, uh, mechanical damage such as scratches, tears, breaks, and shrinkage, which can lead to a film no longer being able to run through a projector or a printer. As I already mentioned, vinegar syndrome and nitrate decomposition can come about when a film is not stored properly and are unfortunately exceedingly common. Additionally, mold, mildew, and fungus can also appear when storage conditions are less than ideal. So a quick breakdown of how a film makes it from camera to screen. A piece of film runs through a camera capturing the image. From the original camera negative, an intermediate positive is made, known as an inner positive for color and a fine grain for black and white. From there, a duplicate negative or inner negative is made. Combine this with the soundtrack negative, and you have a final conformed print, which can now be projected and screened across the world. OK, so now that we know what a film is made of and how it's created, we can move on to the concept of preserving and saving this material. At the Academy Film Archive, we focus on four main lines of thought. Conservation, so building our collection, acquiring material, and hunting down film elements to keep safe in our climate-controlled vaults. Preservation, or duplicating film and video materials to safer and more stable stocks or formats. Restoration, so restoring this content to how it was originally seen and enjoyed, uh, correcting color fading, reducing dirt and scratches, things of that nature. And then finally, access. We've acquired this material, we've preserved and restored it, now let's let people see and experience it. Film material can come to us in a variety of different ways. For best picture films that have won or been nominated for an Academy Award, it's part of these submission rules that studios provide us with prints or DCPs. For smaller and more independent films, we oftentimes reach out to filmmakers ourselves, asking them to consider long-term storage with us. Sometimes, though, film just falls directly into our laps. With the closing of major film labs like Duart and Deluxe, the Academy has taken on hundreds of pallets of material that was forgotten about or left behind. Now, we always make an effort to track down the filmmakers or copyright holders of this material, and so far, everyone is happy to have us keep their films safe. Once material comes to us, it needs to be examined and documented before we just stick it in the cold. Additionally, before we can begin any preservation work, we need to understand what it is we've got to work with. <coughs> The inspection process is pretty straightforward. The film is wound through on a film inspection bench and evaluated for its physical condition. Archivists and preservationists may have different methods for documenting their film inspections, but no matter the method, you can kind of see here all the different aspects of the films we are evaluating. We look for basic identifying factors such as gauge, stock, edge codes, footage length, etc. And then we look for any kind of damage, whether it be scratches and tears or decay and deterioration. We document title cards and copyright information as well, going straight from whatever cards are on the element itself. Now, if this is just general inventory, something that will most likely be going directly into the vaults, the inspection might stop there. If, however, a preservationist is determining if the element is a good preservation source or researching a potential preservation project, um, so let's say there's a question of length or an international versus domestic version of a film, then we're going to dig a little deeper with our inspection. We might put the film on a sink block, making note of each stock change, each splice, each uh, individual shot, or we'll put two elements on the bench at once to compare and determine which is a better uh, condition or preservation source. 
All of this information is then written down and entered into our collections database. A huge part of preservation and film archiving in general is documentation. Each item that is inventoried and inspected by an archivist or preservationist has a record created within our database. That record is then verified by a cataloger who confirms the information and ensures that the film is, or the item is linked to the appropriate film title. So um, they also confirm and or expand other relevant information like release dates, credits, and cast. Our database allows us to know everything we have within our collection. And as you may remember, that is an enormous amount of material, almost 200,000 items. Within each title record, we can see every element we have in our vaults. We are currently implementing a new system that will eventually allow us to see everything the Academy as a whole has related to a particular title. So a photograph, poster, or a manuscript in our library, a prop or costume in our upcoming museum, or an original picture negative in the film archive. Being able to search our collection enables the next phase of preservation, which is prioritization. After film inspections are completed, we take that information and begin to prioritize the collection, deciding which films to preserve first. The criteria for pri prioritization can vary from archive to archive. In the case of our institution, one of our mandates is to preserve films that were either nominated for or received Academy Awards, uh, although that is certainly not the only factor when deciding on a preservation project. We also preserve titles based on the uniqueness of our holdings when compared to other archives around the world, films that are entering or are in severe stage of decay, films that showcase culturally or historically significant people or places, such as home movies or amateur films, and potential screenings or funding opportunities to help prioritize what films we'll turn to next. We constantly communicate and collaborate with other major institutions we want to be sure that we're not preserving a title that has already been preserved at another archive when there might be another film in our holdings that could use that attention. So once a film has been slated for preservation, it is time to send that best element to a film laboratory for printing. Our preservation workflow is still mainly photochemical, which means we're copying film from film to film. These days, we're also finishing projects digitally with a 2K or 4K scan, and even utilizing digital restoration and preservation tools much more frequently, but I'll get to that side of things in just a moment. Because from a preservation standpoint, celluloid film is still the most stable and secure way to save a film. Like I said, you keep it cold and dry, it can last hundreds of years, but the digital world is still a little more unknown when it comes to preservation. Now, the Academy Film Archive doesn't have any printing equipment on site, so we outsource our film work to various film labs. And other members would stand on stage, narrating their rare images of unique locales, describing colorful tales of their travels, using a local translator if needed. The venues where the Wanderwell crew presented their travel films varied from town to town. Theater sizes ranged from a 2,000-seat grand movie palace in Barcelona all the way down to a 50-seat theater in a small village in India. They even presented their films in very remote locations, including a makeshift theater under a tin shack with no walls outside a diamond mine in Africa. <laughs> By the end of the tour, Aloha, Walter, and the rest of the Wanderwell crew had traveled to 43 countries between 1919 and 1925. <coughs> Along the journey, they had built up an impressive collection of moving images, recording on film dozens of countries, cultures, and historic landmarks. As the crew set sail for Los Angeles, they realized American audiences had probably never seen half the countries that are depicted in their films. International travel was still a luxury for most people. For American moviegoers, one of the most popular genres at the time were travelogues, or short films that presented unique and faraway lands to audiences. Typically, these short films were presented prior to the feature-length attraction. For their U.S. premiere, Aloha and Walter decided to compile all of the footage from their world tour into one full-length, silent travelogue film that they could present as a touring roadshow across America. They titled their film With Car and Camera Around the World, and the two clips I've shown here are both excerpts from that work. Now, both Aloha and Walter were quite the celebrities upon their arrival in L.A., Reports of their world travels made their way through Hollywood, and they were treated like dignitaries by some important and highly influential celebrities of the time. Which brings me to the last clip I want to show. This next footage 
was shot during Aloha's time in Hollywood on a visit to the United Artists Studio. And it features some familiar faces, Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks, two names that you may remember have an intimate connection with the Academy. So here we have the Queen of Hollywood, Mary Pickford, and children from the cast of the movie she was shooting at the time called Little Annie Rooney, which, by the way, the Academy has also preserved through a grant from the Mary Pickford Foundation. Mary is affixing a good luck sticker onto the front of the car. And Aloha was really tall, as I said. <laughs> Mary Pickford was not tall. Uh, and then, so this is Douglas Fairbanks, Mary's husband. He was one of the most popular actors of the silent era. And he here is expressing his good wishes for the future travels of the new Wanderwell car, christened with the name Miss Los Angeles. Aloha mentions in her writings of this meeting that Fairbanks expressed his jealousy of their ability to travel the world, that he wanted to, quote, get out of studio rut and go off to seek adventure himself. These three clips were just a snippet of the amazing footage captured by Aloha and the Wanderwell expedition. What I've shown today is the result of a long-term project overseen by my colleague, Heather Linville, to preserve not only Aloha's collection, but to hopefully preserve Aloha's entire body of work, which is held at a variety of other institutions. These clips were preserved both photochemically and digitally from either the original 35 millimeter camera negatives or remaining 35 millimeter nitrate prints from the time. To date, we've preserved about three hours of content from within our own collection. So finally, I'd like to show you an avant-garde film pres uh, preserved by my colleague, Mark Toscano, who works specifically on our uh, extensive experimental film collection at the Academy. Pinismo is a short film made by avant-garde filmmaker and artist Carmen Diavino in 1963. Of the 11 films Diavino made before transitioning solely into sculpture, Pinismo Pini was the only film for which he still had the orig original <coughs> negative in his possession. The negatives for all of his other films are lost, and all that remains are faded and damaged 16 millimeter prints, and there's sadly nothing that could produce quality preservation or restoration results. Pinissimo was shot on 35 millimeter, and like The Ballad of Gregorio Cortez, was also printed at Duart Film Labs in New York. The film was distributed most widely in 16 millimeter, as with uh, all of his films, <laughs> but it was shot on a silent era 35 millimeter camera he got in the early 60s. The camera was even hand cranked and according to his nephew is still sitting on his farm in upstate New York, completely rested. The original negative of Pianissimo and his other faded prints were also left in an old barn on Diavino's farm. And it's really only a small miracle that the negative did not befall the same fate as those other prints. Oftentimes it can seem like nothing but luck that one film should completely deteriorate while another sits alongside it seemingly untouched, but celluloid film is very volatile and it can have many variables. So in 2007, working from the original color camera negative and a track negative, a new answer print was created. The track was captured from this answer print and restored, and a new magnetic track and optical track name were made, as well as the new inner positive, inner negative, and two show prints.
as a, a really quick side note, that piano from the film, uh, when Diavino and his wife moved from New York City to upstate New York, they didn't want to tr travel with it. They didn't want to move it. So he smashed it to pieces with an ax, what, much to the dismay of his family, because I think they really would have loved to have kept it. And it, it probably looked pretty cool with all that paint on it, but he destroyed it. <laughs> uh, and that's it for me. So Great. thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. That's wonderful. So much in this very short time. I know. Sorry, I really uh, crammed a lot in there. <laughs> right. So uh, we're going to open up to questions to anyone who has any questions to ask Tessa for her wonderful presentation, <laughs> um, which I think all of us really enjoyed. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, what was it like? I can't imagine what it was like. Oh. oh, thank you. I can't imagine what it was like when uh, you guys opened those Apu Trilogy cans. I, emotionally, not technically, it's not the technical stuff, but what the heck did, were you thinking when you saw that burnt film? I mean, I was think, as I was sitting here watching it, I was thinking, well, if it were me, I would say, okay, let's move on to something else. I think a lot of people would have had that reaction. It's really a testament to Michael Friend that he kept those because, so I wasn't there for the initial traumatic opening when they decided they wanted to use those. But I have gone into the vaults and I have opened those cans and I have looked at them. And even knowing that we have saved that and it's we have a new DCP and film outs and it's, it's preserved, opening those cans is is still kind of traumatic. It's really heartbreaking to see this destroyed film of something so great. I mean, it's it's definitely, fil cinema in general is an emotional yeah. experience, yeah. even when you're not watching it. I mean, just thinking of, you know, memories and nostalgia, all of that is wrapped up into the concept of cinema, and it's the same for looking at the actual material, handling it. It's still an emotional response within me. And but then Michael Friend and all of you uh, went ahead and did it, amazingly did it. Yeah, and I want to really stress that Bologna, the Imaginary yeah, Travata, exactly. it, no one else could have done what they did. They're, we Those sat in the vaults for 20 years, and yes, it's it's testament to Michael Friend and the Academy that we kept it and didn't throw out, but there was nothing. We didn't think there was anything that could have been done. We, we kept it but thinking it would never be saved because no other lab could do what they did. They spent hour, thousands of hours. And, and I, I saw the process. I yeah, was in Bologna. So I saw was the, taught firsthand. Yeah, um, so it he was incredible. Have, yeah. I mean, I, I say that uh, there's nobody better than Mariana. Uh, yes. Uh, Mariana DeSantis, who actually worked to replace uh, people who attended the workshop would, would would vouch for Mariana because she actually, which you saw in the film. She's in, yeah, so yeah. you could see them repairing all of those yeah, perfs, yeah. perf by perf. I mean, that, to have the ability to continue to do such labor-intensive yep. work, you really have to have a passion and a yeah. love for it, and that is completely documented with the restoration of the Apu Trilogy. And I think, I think that's, that's the really the big struggle we have in India. Uh, is something which we, uh, I mean, when we, when the Criterion came and we, we did the workshop with them, the whole idea that so many of our films in India uh, are lying in that kind of state, uh, many of them decomposed, uh, may, may not be the fires, but especially some of the nitrate works. And I think this particular work of restoration is a great example and it can set a future example of people in India, especially because because you know Patel Panchali for them is like the, it's like the Bhagavad Gita or the Bible. <laughs> we, I mean that's the, that's the motion of. So when you're talking about emotions, I mean I was getting. I mean whenever we we talk about Patel Panchali and we talk about the cans, it's it's for us it's like a it's like a dead body which has been just you know it was a mummy lying at the at the academy and mm -hmm. then you suddenly brought it back to life like mummy returns back, <laughs> and and uh, you you can just imagine being in that field. So I think it's incredible work what they did. I mean, and Bologna hats off, Davide Posi and his team. Uh, I can tell you that... Uh, yeah, no one else, it, it would not be restored without yeah. them. No and, one and else And that's what we it. need to do. Painstakingly take your time on every film because film is an art. Yes, and, and, and preservation is, it takes a long time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, years. It can take years. 
We, for one film to be preserved. We don't live in a world of taking your time. <laughs> Not anymore. Well, we <laughs> need to learn. Yeah. We need, need to, to go back. We learn. Yes, we need to learn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think so. And any more questions? Yeah, sure. Is there a mic? Yeah. Uh, very briefly, do we have any features on uh, the 9.5 and 28 millimeter format or from any country at the Academy? I, I don't oh, know. at the Academy, I don't think we have any full-length features. Right, because Pathé released it at 9.5 for format, so they were more shorter versions of yeah, films. Yeah, so like I said, it was more for the home market. So it's a lot yeah. more amateur filmmakers using that format. Um, and when yeah. you're restoring this uh, 9.5 or 28 millimeter format, you just do it by scanning because I don't think any projection or editing facilities would be available for that. Format. Well, there is. There is. Yeah. The Pathés have it. Uh, they, they have, have it. it. They still have it. Yeah, um, and um, the I Institute, Haga Film in Amsterdam, yes. can also do yeah. nine point five and twenty eight millimeter. But there's not many labs that can do it. Um, I think now that we do have digital tools, right. it is much more uh, meant for probably digital preservation. Um, but and, and that's why you know uh, Bologna has this. Um, I think we all connected to Bologna in that fact that they had this restoration film festival. Uh, every year, and you would be amazed to see the incredible work and different formats work which has been restored. Uh, basically, they're all film formats. So whether it's from 8mm, 9.5, or 28, whatever, they're all available and they're all restored. So I think that they're, they're sort of preserving our heritage, and I think this is something which we need to take a lead in our own country. Is is uh, it's not just the responsibility of the National Film Archive or a foundation like ours, which is Film Heritage Foundation, is the responsibility of every filmmaker, every one who's existing in this planet, to think how are we going to preserve this so that the future generations can watch this wonderful film. And I'm telling you, I think even Ray would be surprised with the kind of restoration he did. And I, I wish he was alive to see this wonderful yeah. film because I remember meeting the cameraman, Subrata And wonderful story I have with him is, that he was, you know, uh, even in the last stages, he was teaching in, 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 a, in a film school. And he told me that, uh, what do you think people are going to think about my work? And I asked him, you know, I said, why do you say that? He said, such bad quality of DVDs or, or material is available, they will never think anything of me. They'll think this is so easy because everybody's watching everything on the net. And, and he was perhaps India's greatest cameraman. I mean, not only India's, but I think one of the world's renowned cameramen. And I wish he was alive to see his wonderful work because you can see the, the relationship Ray had with his mm -hmm. cameraman. Uh, Ray was never the same once Subrata Mitra stopped working with him. You know, Ray, but the visual which we are talking about, which Joe spoke about, yes. that the visual metaphor of Ray's films, it comes from this beautiful cameraman. And, and, and that's what we do we, we, when we restore films. We bring back not just the filmmaker, mm -hmm. but all the people, they start looking beautiful. They start living their lives, you know. Yeah, it's the same story for the Ballad of Gregorio Cortez. We brought right. in the cinematographer and had them all watch our, what we had accomplished in it. All that you could see were either these blow-up 35 prints or a really terrible VHS. Right. And so it was, it was life-changing almost to have him see it, how it was originally, how he originally made it. Made it, yeah. 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 And, and you know, you have these wonderful stories, which Davide tells me, that when you bring back filmmakers, some of these stories, uh, they say, we want to make this change. We want to make that he change. Did, because, you know, did, when yeah. I shot that... He did when have I shot, a few notes yeah, that were like... When I <laughs> shot that, I didn't have the budget. Now you have. <laughs> yeah. you got to stop them there. Yes, yeah, so it's a very uh, <laughs> fine balance that you have to kind of make. Yeah, to yeah. you always make struggling. Make sure we don't go too far. Yeah, because, you know, I believe that, that one of the key things in restoration is that it's not the same film. I mean, you've already restored it, so it becomes another version. Mm. So you are talking about the original version, you're talking about the restored version, and then you can have various other versions, which people do, which is like some people color it, some people do various things. So I think those are aspects which can be explored. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, lastly, I read in one of the credits that some of these films are probably on loan or hire. Uh, what is the arrangement? Do you outright buy stuff or you... Uh, are lent it uh, for a certain period uh, with some rights? So the Academy's collection, we don't own any of the licensing or copyright, but we do loan out the material, assuming whoever is asking to borrow it can acquire the rights from the rights holder. Um, we loan to nonprofit and other like educational theaters for free. We don't charge any fees, which is not, it's kind of unheard of, but 
Um, if you're a nonprofit theater, we will give it to you for free. So we have a very extensive loan program. Um, we are still ma mainly loaning film prints, which is heartening to hear, but we do loan DCPs as well. But yeah, we don't have the licensing, so it's up to whoever wants to, s to screen something to, to get that. But once they get that permission, we'll send it. That's within the states or even overseas? Worldwide, worldwide. Okay. Yeah, so Thank we're you. actually doing, there's a very big ret uh, Ray retrospective in France right now, and we have loaned all of, almost all of our Ray preserved prints to France for free. So. Uh, congratulations to you <laughs> and Steve, three months after your great day, you are here conducting a <laughs> workshop. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> I want to know what's the criteria that the Academy follows if you get a request from, say, regional films, uh, among the early regional films, which seem to survive somewhere, and uh, they would like them to be preserved. Uh, producers, directors may not have the budget, so historically they are important. And if they approach the academy, what's the criteria that the academy would have? So we really only preserve things that are within our own collection, but we accept material both via donation, so someone can give it to the Academy outright, or they can deposit it with us, which means we are basically just storing it for them. Um, but once it's in our collection, um, it really depends on our budget per year, but we do have a lot of film. I work specifically on short films usually, and so I always get, I get approached a lot by short filmmakers uh, who would like to get deposit the films. right deposit, but also preserve their films or get some kind of digital copy because it's very expensive. Um, to do this work. So it's, it's the criteria, it's hard to put into words because it's so variable. It really changes film to film, uh, person to person. Um, so it's not a straightforward answer. I can't, I couldn't just say, oh, you call me and I say yes or no. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not a very straightforward answer. I'm sorry. It's, yeah, yeah, because because I think it's very important that I mean, it, the, it doesn't become yeah. a dumping ground. You know, that's yeah. the thing. So the Academy is very lucky that because of the Oscars, we have a pretty hefty budget in terms of preservation, much more than uh, any other kind of nonprofit or regional film archive would probably have. Right. Um, so we do have a lot of leeway in terms of how much we can preserve each year, but we still have the same constraints in s the sense of budget. Uh, it's it's prioritizing yeah. what you work on and where your money goes. Right. It's a huge part of preservation. And, and Tessa, but, uh, you know, you're fortunate in the United States, uh, the number of archives there are. Yeah, there's it's a lot. It's not just one, but there are, right. there are hundreds of them. So we do know. have a main government, Library of Congress, and a national archive. But then And each university has UCLA. But universities have lots of archives. There's other small regional archives. Um, so we're, we are very fortunate yeah. that and terrific film is being saved all over the country. Yes. Yeah. And that's what we need in India. Yeah. 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 That's <laughs> all right. That's the last. Thank you so oh, much, okay. Tessa. Thank you Thank all Thank you. So wonderful. Much. And uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the trip in Goa and go back with some wonderful memories. Oh, of course. I already have some. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>